Hi, and welcome to Mid-South Viewpoint. I'm Byron Tyler. Pleasure to have you here on today's program. In 1929, Herbert Hoover was U.S. president. The stock market prices plummeted. Securities lost $26 billion, making the first financial disaster of the Great Depression. Cost to mail a first-class stamp was only two cents. CBS was founded by William Paley, and penicillin was first used to fight an infection. Also, our guest today was born, and we want to welcome Dr. Jay Adams to Bot Radio Network. Jay, pleasure to have you here today. Thank you, Byron. And uh, I don't know, uh, maybe my birth had something to do with that depression. I'm not sure. I don't think so. But, you know, I am kind of curious. Uh, but, and before we get in, in, into the details of our conversation today, uh, for about almost 50 years now, you have been at the forefront of a movement calling pastors and other Christian workers back to Scripture in their counseling ministry. Well, I've tried hard to do that. I didn't uh, start out intending to do it, but uh, when I had a class that was given to me at Westminster Seminary and that nobody else wanted to take, a class in biblical counseling, I had no background, no uh, experience, and could find no text that would enable me to teach this course. So it set me to work on digging into the Scriptures to find out what God had to say, because that was the important thing, and that was the beginning of what I was involved in. I don't know how much it was a forefront or what, but uh, the Lord blessed it, and there's been some people who have been helped. I can't imagine all of the, uh, of course, I wasn't there in 1929, and you were just an infant, but uh, our nation as a whole coming out of, the, of course, the Great Depression, the beginning of that time, and uh, the things that it caused, uh, you know, in people's lives, uh, probably hopelessness. I know there's a lot of people committed suicide in those days, too. Uh, backing up and just thinking back in that time period, would you say that the culture at large had similar values to the church at that time? Well, in many ways they did. In many ways they never did. The culture never has the same values as the church when it comes to the scriptures and the way of salvation and all the rest of it that we hold so dear. Uh, they they have their own values and they're always at, at, at odds with the church of Jesus Christ. But there is a, a way in which the church permeates the thinking of a culture and it keeps it from getting worse than it is. It's it's the idea of being the salt uh, that the, Jesus spoke about. Salt preserves. It doesn't uh, do anything to erase a, a putrid uh, kind of things that happen in, in uh, the society, but it certainly does a lot to keep that kind of society getting worse. That's one of the problems we have in our society today. Where's the balance between our methods of communicating Scripture in an ever-changing culture without compromising the message? Well, that balance is what Jesus uh, spoke about when he said to be wise as serpents but harmless as doves. He was concerned that we, uh, that we do those things which are, are appropriate to the situation in such a way that we were able to win others to Christ, but on the other hand, not be one ourselves to the unbelievers viewpoint a bridge when we bridge something with other people who are not believers a bridge runs both ways and you can either be drawn over to their culture or they could be drawn to yours and uh, our job is to influence the world as such you think sometimes the church has become more like the world's values instead of having its, you know, living by biblical values? Well, it, it more or less always is that way. It, there's nothing that it becomes except worse or not as bad. But uh, the world cannot have the same values that the culture has because it doesn't have the Spirit of God at work enabling people to live according to what the Scriptures have to say. How many times does a pastor counsel someone before ending that counseling relationship due to the counselees' uh, continual act of being disobedient to the authority of Scripture? Well, there, you, you've got two things going when you've got a pastor counseling. Uh, a pastor is with his people all the time, hopefully, and uh, influencing them not only through his counseling ministry, but also through uh, preaching of the Word and various other activities as he's involved in. So that uh, uh, formal counseling 
that is done in some kind of a specialized way may last as long as 10 weeks, but uh, shouldn't last any longer than that. If you see counseling going over a long period of time, somebody's, somebody's doing something wrong. What are some common problems related to counseling today? Number one, you've got marriage problems, family problems, uh, the whole breakup of the family in our day, which is so tragic and has become the source of many other problems as well. I'd say is a major and almost the most significant problem in our society today. Mm, that's so sad, too, or as the breakup of the families you mentioned. It certainly is, yes. Can a counselor ever overuse Scripture in their counseling? Yes, he can. He can overuse Scripture in the sense that he bombards people with too, more, too many verses for them to understand. He ought not use a lot of verses in, in giving counsel. He says she ought to focus on one or two critical verses and explain them, exegete them, apply them, show people how these verses really are appropriate to their situation. Talk about a counselor becoming uh, directive and authoritative in their counseling. Well, he should be no more directive and no more authoritative than the book itself. The, the Bible is an authoritative book. We can't avoid that, and we shouldn't avoid that or should make any attempt to do so. But on the other hand, he should never be authoritative about his own viewpoints and his own ideas about how to implement various biblical uh, propositions. For example, if, uh, if the, somebody's involved in an adulterous relationship, he can say very authoritatively, you've got to break it up because the Bible clearly says you shall not commit adultery. Now, how is he going to break it up? Is he going to go talk to the person involved? Is he going to talk to both parties? Is he going to talk to one of them? Is he going to talk to them individually, talk to them together, talk to other people who are involved in the situation? Uh, all that is, is a matter of wisdom that grows out of general principles of Scripture. But there's no direct uh, comment in which he has to say, we must do this. He can't talk on the same level there as he talks about when he says you must break up the relationship because he's talking at one point, the Bible's talking at the other. What support, Jay, would you give a pastor that fears retribution when speaking biblical truth to a church member concerning their engagement in a lifestyle like homosexuality or other controversial issues? I'm not, no, not really concerned about giving to him too much support. I want him to understand that when the Bible speaks authoritatively about such matters, he must speak that way too. He's not there speaking in his own name. He's speaking for God. He's a man that God has touched and God has called and God has said, this is my word and I want you to proclaim it and I want you to insist upon the word. Now, he, he certainly wants to do it in the most, uh, in the wisest way possible. He wants to be as harmless as a dove and so on while doing it, and yet he wants to be uh, wise as a snake. He wants to be able to, to say things very plainly and clearly, and I think too many pastors today are fudging. They're not really saying things that they ought to be saying and saying them as straightforwardly as they ought to do. Talk about warfare in counseling. Warfare? Warfare. The warfare of counseling. Well, the warfare is not with the individual unless he wants to fight, but uh, the warfare is with the evil one. We, we, uh, we war against spiritual forces. That's what Paul said, and he said we need to use spiritual kinds of weapons in order to, to carry on that battle, which is his word and his spirit and not our uh, attitudes or any of the rest of it or any of the, the ways in which the world itself would fight about matters. We fight not in order to win a battle, but to win people. And that's what we want to do. We want to take people captive. They take their minds captive for Jesus Christ and to get them to know him and then live for him. Jay, typically, how do you start your day? What, when you, from the time you wake up, as you prepare for your day, what, what's the process and the routine of, of Jay Adams' day? When I step out of bed, which is a little hard to do sometimes, um, I pray two things. I ask the Lord to give me uh, the ability to live for him that day and to honor him 
And on the other hand, I ask him to keep us safe in our family so that we may be able to carry on his work. And then a day is carried on according to whatever may be designed for that day. No two days are alike. What about a method of Bible study? Do you have a certain devotion way you like to read Scripture? Or No, I don't, I don't do devotions. I do Bible study devotionally. In other words, I'm concerned about learning what the Word of God has to say, but then about what it has to say for my life and how my life is changed by it. So I don't think any Bible study ought to be done non-devotionally. We ought not just to, or just to learn the meaning of something. We ought to learn what that means to us and how our, our lives ought to be different. You know, I asked that same question years ago to Dr. John MacArthur, and he gave me the exact same answer. So. Well, I didn't copy him. I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, I think you might have him beat by a few years. So uh, maybe maybe he picked that up from you. <laughs> maybe so. I don't know. John's a good guy, and I enjoy him and a lot of things he has to do and say. Don't agree with all his doctrine, but uh, he's all right. Let's talk about uh, church discipline and how do we institute church discipline when it hasn't been a regular part of a church's ministry? Well, you know it hasn't. And uh, that's that's one of the reasons we have problems in our churches that, that we're not really reclaiming people. And church discipline has not has doesn't have as its goal to get rid of people. Its goal is to win them to a new lifestyle, one that really honors Christ. Uh, we want to try to keep these people in the church, but differently. We want to have these people change their lives so that they're honoring him in the way that they live and move and, and have relationships with other people. Church discipline has not been done in the church, and that's why we have many of the problems that we do. And then we, we've got to reinstitute church discipline. And its goal, of course, is to win people back to living for Christ more faithfully. I, that's why I wrote a book on that subject, which I think uh, needed to be written. Of course, you've written many books. You've written, what, close to 50 books. I, yeah, but this is the one on church discipline I was talking well, yeah, about. I, I, yeah, I understand that, but I know you also— I've written maybe over 150. 150 books? Yeah, more like that. Well, I guess Amazon doesn't have all your books then. Yeah, that, you haven't got them all. <laughs> I haven't found them all yet. I brought a few of them here with me— uh, uh, I had a whole bunch of them tr in translation and uh, various languages, so, and I can't read them. So I thought maybe it might be useful for, for some of your foreign students who are here studying to see a few of those things in their own languages. Jay, how does biblical change not only constitute saying no to bad habits, but replacing bad habits for godly habits. Well, you've talked about it. Uh, you talked about replacing. That's the key word. You don't want to get rid of something. You want to replace something. And that's the biblical concept of putting off and putting on, which you find in Colossians, which you find in Ephesians, which you find in Peter's writings all over the place. The, the biblical picture is that we replace those things which are wrong and which are harmful with those things which are biblical and which are honoring to God and to Christ. What about somebody really struggling with habits, you know, just over and over again, you know, and they, they say they pray about them, they, they are memorizing Scripture, but they're still struggling with those same habits. Well, 90 percent of the time when that struggle takes place, it takes place because of what you just mentioned, that they're trying to get rid of something, period. And you can't just get rid of something. You must replace it with the right thing. And that makes all the difference. When you work, first of all, and, and most uh, earnestly at learning the new ways and to honor God in those ways, that's what, what gets rid of the other. There was a famous sermon at one time preached called the uh, – uh, how, how did it go now? The uh, expulsion of – Oh, I forgot the words, but the idea was that it that it you had to replace it with with the truth, and you must you must replace error with truth and with right living, and uh, that makes the difference. You mentioned that uh, you have published close to 150 the books. The power of a of a new new uh, something or other. What was it? New that sermon you're trying to think of? 
Pardon me? The sermon you're mentioning? Not my sermon, yeah, no, the right. one I was talking the about. The one you're talking about. I'm still mumbling with it, <laughs> fumbling with it. As I mentioned, and you just mentioned, you straightened me out, uh, you've published close to uh, 150 books, not to mention the numerous articles and publications. Uh, which of your books was personally the most challenging to write and why? Well, they're all challenging. Uh, but the reason why I write books is not because... I'm interested in uh, getting material out here, there, and making some money or something of that sort. I write for pastors mainly, and uh, you don't get that much money from pastors. They haven't got it to begin with. So what I'm concerned about is helping pastors do their job in a better way. And uh, I write I write when, when a topic becomes pertinent to me, and uh, pastors seem to be struggling with it. Sometimes I have Q&A periods with pastors. I'm going to have one here. And uh, I find out in those, those Q&A periods that they have this problem and that problem, the other problem. Certain things come up again and again and again. Those are the things I want to write about because those are the things that pastors are struggling about with. And so... Uh, it's not a matter of which ones are more difficult, which ones are more are easier to write. They're all hard to write, and they're all easy to write. They're easy in the sense that you know what to write. They're hard in the doing of the of it. But uh, the interesting thing is, how can we help those pastors? What's the most bizarre counseling situation that you've had to deal with in your ministry over these years? Well, I've had all kinds of weird things. I've had people come over to the desk after me to go after me. I've had people walk in on the in the room on their knees instead of on their legs, on their feet, and uh, uh, we've had people go come in to sit in the corner on the floor rather than uh, sit in a chair. Uh, you know, there are all sorts of interesting things that happen, but uh, those are not the things that that you notice. You just go on and keep counseling people regardless. We had one fellow who this fellow came over to the desk after me. We. I had a couple other students in there with me who were learning how to counsel by sitting in. And uh, so we we tackled him and we took his belt off and we tied it around his feet and we went on counseling him. <laughs> well, as you've just alluded to here, I, mean, I know you spent thousands and thousands of hours counseling individuals through an assortment of problems and issues. Uh, when you leave the office and head for home, and I know now your office is in your home, uh, what have been some challenges in implementing your counseling insight into your own family's life over the years? Yeah, uh, that, that, of course, is something that uh, you always want to do. I'm going to be talking about that matter actually in chapel today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Ezra. And Ezra did three things. He was determined, first of all, to learn the Word of God, and he was determined to live the Word of God. Then he was determined to teach others about it. And I think that's a critical thing, that you never really learn anything until you begin to live it. And so I try I try to implement what I, I've learned an awful lot through counseling itself about how I ought to do things in my own home. Of course, I had to learn the hard way because I didn't have that kind of help to begin with. There's been very little in biblical counseling available. There were very few books out there, and what was out there when I began to counsel and began to write was uh, not biblical at all. It was really psychological stuff that was mixed together with a little bit of scripture misused. And uh, so most of it I've had to learn the hard way through uh, struggling through some of these issues myself and my own family and my own family's had those problems too. So we're not uh, apart from any of that. We're all very much a part of it. And uh, it's very much a part of my concern that, that we begin to live that way. Jay, take us back to those growing up years, you know, at home, your folks. Uh, what, was, what was family life like for you in the Adams home? My parents were not Christians. They later on became Christians a good while after I did, was, had the privilege of leading them to Christ. But uh, I was not raised in a Christian home. I was not I didn't go to church very often. I was dragged sometimes to a liberal Methodist church by some people down the street, and I never heard the gospel, yeah. never once. At one time in a class of, a large class of boys, the, the teacher came in and he said, now, fellas, he said, I was, 
Uh, they just twisted my arm. First time I ever heard that expression as a kid. Uh, they twisted my arm to make me teach this class. He says, I don't know anything about the Bible. And he took his Bible and he threw it across the room. And he hit the wall and it came down on top on uh, the table. And he says, we'll leave it there. And that's what he did. It laid there and it gathered dust. And we talked about baseball and dating and things like that all, all uh, year. That was the kind of background I had. There was no Christianity in it whatsoever. I came to know Christ through uh, a friend of mine who was a, a believer, a kid, who, uh, along with the, several of others, used to meet at a certain place. We'd sit and we'd chaw, talk and jaw a little bit about things. And one day he came with a book. It was a, a Fox's book on uh, uh, the Sermon on the Crown, Emmett Fox, who was a liberal writer. And he said, this guy doesn't believe the gospel. This guy doesn't believe the gospel. He was a Christian. And uh, he said, he doesn't believe the gospel. He kept talking about not believing the gospel. And I'm shaking my head, you know, yeah, sure, I understand. But I know a thing. I didn't even know what this word gospel meant. But I, I, he kept using the word gospel, and I kept thinking about it. So I went home, and um, I dug around, and there was a little little old khaki-covered New Testament my father had been given in World War I. And uh, I dug that out, and I stuck it in my back pocket. I didn't want anybody to know I was going to start reading the Bible. And I read that New Testament day and night, wherever I had an opportunity, on streetcars and wherever it was. Uh, uh, I read that over a two-month period, and somewhere during that period, I came to understand the gospel and what it meant, and I believed it. I couldn't tell you the exact day or hour, but I know it happened during that two-month period while I was reading the New Testament. That's how I became a Christian. And how long after that did you sense that God was directing right you? Right away. Right away. Right away. I said, you know, I've got I've got to start talking about this message in some way that other people would hear about it. I never heard about it. They didn't tell me anything about it. Why didn't I hear about it in church? Maybe I could go into, into the ministry and become somebody who who really preached the gospel and people could hear it. Maybe there'd be one place, at least in the city, where somebody would come to know the gospel. So it was like that. That's exciting. That's so exciting. The Lord was very good to me. When you look back over all of these years of ministry, what brings you the most joy when you think about it? Oh, well, there's no doubt about that. It's when you see believers who have come to faith in Christ through your ministry and who uh, are growing and leading other people to Christ and doing things that they ought to be doing for him. <laughs> when you see the growth of believers who have come to Christ. Have you got stories of those who, have, as a result of your ministry, I'm, I'm sure you do, just thinking about in other places of the world, not just here in the U.S., but other countries that maybe you stay in contact with different people who in turn have ministries in other places of the world as a result of your ministry? Well, I do stay in contact with some of those people, especially in places like Brazil. And there's a group in they started something in Brazil, and there's a group in Germany that has has be, has become a biblical counseling group. And uh, uh, the been around various places like that. But in, in uh, uh, South Africa, there's a a movement of sorts. And uh, but I I don't try to 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 hook up with them directly. I think they ought to have their own local. Uh, organization once they've come to know what to do and what it's all about, and so uh, I haven't I haven't had a direct contact with them except letters here and there and emails and that kind of thing. Jay, you've mentioned, of course, your passion and your heartbeat for pastors. Right, uh, that's my concern. What instruction do you offer someone who's following a call to minister? or to be in the ministry as a career, what, what are some of the things as they look and believe, yes, I believe there's a specific call in my life to go into a gospel-centered ministry? They had better learn exegesis and theology. Uh, you don't take courses in counseling primarily. That's quite secondary. The main thing is to know your scriptures and know the, the God of those scriptures. And... Uh, if they don't, many of the problems that have come in the field of counseling have come from people who have studied counseling, have studied psychology, have studied sociology, things of this sort, and they don't know the scriptures. And they twist the scriptures in order to fit their psychology, which is a terrible thing. You can't do that to the Word of God and have it work. You can't put something else together with it and have the scriptures stay the same. 
So uh, my concern is that people know how to exegete the Scriptures and then how to apply the Scriptures to life. And if they don't know that, they better not do anything else with other people until they're ready. If you could take everything you know today and, and go back to when you first started the ministry, would you do anything different? Everything, probably. <laughs> you know, I, I haven't sat down and thought about that in particular, but uh, uh, I suppose everything I'd do quite differently if I had that knowledge. But you can never do that. So it's kind of a senseless question, isn't it? It is a senseless question, <laughs> but I ask it, though. <laughs> you and your wife, Betty Jane, have been, have been married for how long? All our lives that we've been married. <laughs> All your lives. <laughs> 64 years this June. Oh, what about the very first time you laid eyes on Betty Jane? I didn't lay eyes on her face. I laid eyes on her hair. I <laughs> sat right behind her. <laughs> was that at church? No, it was at Youth for Christ meeting. Was that prior to your salvation or afterwards? No, it was afterwards, yeah. Tell me about the spark when you first started talking and just building that relationship. Well, it didn't happen that way. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, it was gradual. It was very subdued. But once it got going, it moved. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, it's been a wonderful honor and a pleasure to sit oh, down with you I don't even want today. to hear that. Just forget it. Well, it has been, though. I appreciate yeah. the opportunity. And the last time we talked on the telephone— and so I was so thrilled to know we were going to have to sit down and do this interview today. Well, you can get through with John MacArthur, but not with me. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about, I want to make sure I'm saying it right, the Institute for Nutheic Studies. Yes. Okay. Right. Tell me about INS. it. INS. I know that's really your heartbeat. That's what all the focus of your ministry is all tied up in. Well, there have been a lot of things I've been focusing on, but, you know, they they go by the way, and you, you then take— uh, you place your focus on something new in each year. And this is, of course, the thing right now that I'm doing, uh, trying to help other pastors and people who are going to become pastors to do counseling in a biblical fashion. That's that's my heartbeat, but that's not very, very, you, nothing to elaborate on. It's just simple, straightforward fact that pastors need to learn how to counsel biblically. Listeners can go and learn more about the the work of the uh, Institute for Nutheic Studies by going to the website, which is nutheic.org. Nutheic.org, right. Dot org, and can get all the information about the work there. Exactly. Hey, Jay, it's been a pleasure. Well, it's been nice to talk to you, Byron. I really appreciate the opportunity. I know you're getting ready for a chapel service. This interview is being uh, produced here in the studios of Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary. It's a pleasure to be here. It, and, you've been uh, speaking to students this morning? And, and, yeah, and, speaking to them eventually. And, uh, pretty soon, I Pretty guess. soon, yeah. Well, have you been going to classes and talking to students already? Not today, no. We Not, just got in yesterday uh, very late. Okay. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity, and we're going to say goodbye. Friends, we've had the opportunity today to visit with Dr. Jay Adams, and that's all the time we have on this edition of Mid-South Viewpoint. I'm Byron Tyler. Thanks for stopping by. We'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Bye now. <laughs>